you guys expecting great things from God? Don't you appreciate our worship team and, and uh, my mama? This love her so much. If I talk too much, I'll get emotional, and then you guys will think I'm not powerful, but I am, amen? So, so I want to take a second. Stay with me for just a minute, Chris. I, wanted, I want to talk today because we're talking about the kingdom of God. And I want to talk about the king's glory. Now, a lot of times when we think of the glory of God, we think of just the, the cloud, uh, the atmosphere. And that's true. But friends, there's so much more to this glory. Uh, we're going to barely scratch the surface today because when you look at the things of God, they're inexhaustible. We'll be, we'll be learning more about his glory in heaven a million, a billion years from now. When you truly understand the word, you'll, you'll see it in a whole different manner. And, 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 and our part in his glory is so vitally important. And this is why we were talking last week about a new law in the kingdom of God. Because I believe that if we operate in this law, that we will manifest his glory in a tremendous way. And that's the law of love. And uh, we understand this, that love never fails. Because God never fails. He cannot. It's impossible for God to fail. And so if we understand his glory and begin to walk like God, we're going to begin to see signs and wonders and manifestations of the Spirit of God just like Jesus saw. Because we're going to demonstrate who he is to a world who needs to see God's glory. And so all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, we see God's glory manifesting in the in the wilderness with the children of Israel by the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We see the glory of God as the, in the temple as they were dedicating the temple. As they began to worship God, the glory of God filled the house so much so that they couldn't even stand to work because of His glory. And one thing you're going to find out is, is when you get to heaven, the place is full of His glory. You know, I had an experience one time uh, back in the second year of this church. I had a young friend, and uh, I started praying for him. Just kept on, every time I get over into prayer, I sensed that God had a call in his life. So I couldn't shake it. Just kept on praying for him. And, and as a pastor, you love your members, and you don't want them to go, but you want them to follow God more than you want them to stay. And so I said, hey, come over to my house. Everyone was gone. I said, come to my house. I want to talk to you. So... We began to talk, and I said, Brother, I'm sensing something on you. Every time I get into prayer, I sense that God's doing something in you. He said, Yeah, I sense it too. There's been some transition going on in my heart. I'm just not satisfied anymore with the business I have and where I live, have a nice house, and, but I'm not satisfied. I said, Well, let's do something. Let's pray out the plan of God for you. So, right there in my living room, sitting at the bar, we don't have a bar, but you know, a bar. We, all right, we have a bar. No, I'm joking. We don't have a bar. So here we are sitting at the bar. And uh, we begin to pray. Now we started out just simply magnifying God. Because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And we just begin to lift up our hands and say, Lord, you're worthy. And we thank you, Father, that you know all things in every intimate detail of this man's life. And Father, we're coming to you to magnify the great I am, the author. And we begin to worship God and we begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray out mysteries. Friends, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to get filled. Yes. It adds an element of power and insight that you have not. If you don't have it until you get it, you're like, oh, what was I doing all these years? It changes everything. Amen. So we begin to pray in the Holy Spirit and just minister to the Lord. And, and something happened that we weren't expecting. All of a sudden, the very presence of heaven filled up the house. And it got so heavy that it began to push me down. I found myself leaning over the bar, so much so that it pushed me off my seat. It wasn't violent, it was gentle. I found myself flat on the floor, as dirty as it was. It wasn't dirty. As I didn't care because the very presence of heaven, my, the, this young man said, oh God, your presence is so heavy. I can't even move. We were pinned to the floor. We stayed in his presence for, I'd say, at least an hour. Didn't have to say anything. Friends, let me say something. It was heaven on earth. Nothing in this world compares to that 
presence. I don't care how good it is. You get a few minutes in the presence of God, the glory of God, you don't want anything else. This is why when people go to heaven, they don't want to come back. It's better than any drug, any, any experience, any place on this earth. It's the presence of heaven. I, I, I walked for weeks with that presence on me. It was heaven on earth. So today I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the, the glory of a king. Because we serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I hope to get through this today, but if I don't, well, we'll get through it later. Amen. So let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Father, we love you. Father, we know that man is limited, but you're not. And Father, I see my own ability is not capable of changing anyone's life. And so, Lord, I submit to you for your help. Because we know it's the anointing that destroys the yoke of bondage. It's the helper who will bring light and revelation to the precious Holy Spirit. So today, let, let each of us have ears to hear what the Spirit of God wants to say and eyes to see that we can see you clearly and see your glory so we can walk in your glory. Have your way in this service, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus and everyone who greet me said, amen. amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Well, I want to do something. I want to look at a couple examples of this word glory and I want you to see that yes, it is the presence of God, but it's so much more. Amen? So in Exodus chapter 33, we see Moses having a conversation with God. Now, God was frustrated. Now, you may not realize this, as perfect as God is, he can get a little frustrated. And any parents here? As much as you love your children, have you ever gotten just a little bit frustrated with those little rugrats? Anybody? Well, here's God. He, he goes in and delivers the children of Israel out of, the, out of a nation that was the most powerful nation in the world. Not one of the children of Israel were affected, hurt, killed. And when they left, they left Egypt. And the Bible says that they were, there was not one sick or feeble amongst them. And they went out and they plundered. Actually, the children of Egypt were like, get out of here. Take my armor and take my, my crystal leg and go ahead and take the bins. Get out of here. You know, they're like, go. So they loaded them up with money and they left. And they, uh, a cloud by day, pillar by night. I'm telling you what, friends, if you ever are in a tough situation, you look up at night and there's a giant cloud of fire over you, you'd probably say, it's going to be all right. <laughs> You know, a powerful nation's coming against you, and all of a sudden, a big whirlwind of fire comes and separates you from them. You're, you'd probably go, I'm, a, I'm good. <laughs> but not them. And before you get too critical, friends, he said, I wrote this because you're just like them. Because I can guarantee you this, you had a miracle yesterday, and if you're not careful, the problem today will outweigh the glory of that miracle, and you'll begin to worry about it. So he, lay, he leads them through the, 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 the sea on dry land. The army swallowed up behind them. He causes water to flow from a rock. He causes bread to fall from heaven. He causes meat to be air del delivered every single day. Millions of quail. And the children of Israel the whole time, rah, 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 rah. I thought you were a good guy. It's not like anybody you know. Okay, so here's God talking to Moses, and he said, you know what? I'm done with these people. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm done. Let me say this. God cannot stand complaining and grumbling. What's going on back there? All right. He cannot stand when we are questioning his goodness and his faithfulness. So here he is frustrated. He tells Moses, he said, listen, I'm not going with you into the promised land. I'm going to send an angel ahead of you. He'll lead you in, but I'm not going. And you know what Moses said? He said, no, no, no. If you don't go with us, and I love this, if your presence don't go with us, I'm not going in. And the reason why he could say this is because he got up in the presence of God there on the mountain. He knew the presence of God and the glory of God and how wonderful this presence was. And I want to read this and show you what he says here in Exodus chapter 33. 
So God says, I'm not going. He says, go with us. He said, then he said to him, if your presence, I want to say your presence, presence, does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. In other words, I'd rather live in the desert with the presence of God than go into the promised land with beautiful houses and vineyards without your presence. For how then will it be known that your people, and I have found grace in your sight, and I want you to see this, except you go with us. In other words, everything works when he's with you. So how, now look at this. How shall we be separate? That word separate means holy. It means set apart. It means different. How shall we be separate, your people and I, from the people who are upon the face of of the earth. No, Moses knew this. He says, if your presence doesn't go with us, we're going to be just like everybody else. And the problem with this is no one's going to see you in us. And this is what we're going to talk about today. This love of God, the glory of God, the presence of God, it should be so obvious And we get around other people, they go, "Woo, you're different. You must be related to Jesus. Yeah, I am. He's my big brother, and God's my father. Amen? How did you know? There's something different about you. The presence, the grace, the favor, the love. Now, I'm going to say something before I'm getting ahead of myself, but actually the Bible says that we are God's glory. And when you understand glory and you understand this principle, you'll, you'll act differently. And he said... And you're, how will they know the difference between you and I and from the people upon the face of the earth? Verse 17, so the Lord said to Moses, I'll also do this thing which you have spoken. For you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, please, Lord, show me your glory. Everyone say this, Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. God's just waiting for someone to ask. God wanted Moses to say, no, 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 we want you to come. Don't stay. God's like, okay, I'm glad you asked. So then he said this, okay, you want to see my glory. So a lot, a lot of us think, well, that means we're going to see the Shekinah glory. We're going to see a cloud, right? Maybe, but maybe not. So here he said, I'll make my goodness pass before you. And we say goodness. goodness. So Moses asked for God's glory, and God says, okay, great. I'm going to show you my goodness. Glory equals God's goodness. It's fine. Hey, just get it close. Don't worry about me. I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So he's saying here, he says, I'm going to declare who I am because that's my glory. Anybody out there? So he says to Moses, now you can't see my face. No one can see my face. You'll, you know, it'd just be too much for you. He says, so I'm going to hide you in the cliff of a rock. Now, this is a type, if anyone st studied Old Testament types and shadows, this is a type of Christ Jesus. Jesus, we couldn't handle God without being in the rock, Christ Jesus. And he put us in Christ Jesus, so now we can have access to the Father. Amen. Because without Jesus, we'd disintegrate in his presence. Amen. And so he puts, he says, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to put my hand over you. And I, when I walk by, you're going to see my backside. Amen. And so, verse uh, 34, chapter 34, verse 5, he says, now the Lord descended in a cloud. Now there's the cloud. So yes, sometimes you'll see the cloud, but sometimes you won't. And I stood there, and, and I stood there with him, and there, look at this, he proclaimed the names of the Lord. You realize this, that, when, that, that we can actually give God glory by simply declaring who he is? You're Jehovah Rapha, my healer. Ooh, in the midst of sickness, we need to be declaring his glory. You're my provider, Jehovah Jireh. You already saw this ahead of time. You've got me. You're my peace in the middle of anxiety and fear and fretfulness and confusion at home or at work. You, oh, glory to God, you're my peace. Hallelujah. Declaring his name. Amen. And look what he said. He said, now he's talking about his glory. The Lord, the Lord, God, merciful. Everyone say merciful. merciful. Aren't you glad he's merciful? Now look at this. And gracious. You know, you think about this. What does that word gracious mean? Well, what does it mean to have grace? 
you're going to overlook someone's shortcomings. You ever met a real gracious person and they get around a real obnoxious person and you want to punch the obnoxious person in the face, but the graceful person is just so kind and doesn't respond and always has the right answer? That's a gracious person. They're great. They have grace for the crazy people around them. Amen? Oh, we need to be gracious. So he's gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy to, for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. Everyone say, glory. glory. That's who he is. And sin, and by no means uh, uh, clearing the guilty. Now remember, this is written under the Old Covenant. Visiting the uh, iniquity of a father upon their children and children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now this is interesting because he says, I'm not going to let the guilty go free. But you know what he did? He paid for the guilty through Christ Jesus. So he, someone had to pay, but it was his son Jesus. He is so good, friends. Come on, he is so good. You hear me? So he's just not going to let things go. Some, that, something has to pay for it. So he said, I'll pay for it. I'll give you Jesus. And he took care of it. So my first point is simple. I want to talk about the king and his glory. Now, this word glory, we all, who, someone shout out to me. What does this word glory mean? Anybody? It means his presence. Anybody else? His weightiness. Thank you, brother Jeff. It means the heavy, weighty presence of God. That's why I felt like I was being pinned to the ground. It was heaven on earth, and I loved every minute of it. This word kavad, is, it means to the full weight of one. How heavy is God? Well, I don't know, but it's the full weight of one. Listen to this. The word glory means the true nature of Everyone say nature, nature of a thing. So it's not just a cloud. It's actually the nature. Now, we saw God walking in front of him, declaring his name and declaring what he does. He said, you want to see my glory? It's not just a cloud. This is who I am. The great I am. And he says, and he goes on to say, it's the true nature of a thing. It's honor. It's glorious abundance. Ah. Uh. The true abundance of God is manifested in his glory. This is why God does not want anybody poor, because we don't represent his kingdom as a poor person. We represent his kingdom when we look like his children. So when someone in the world sees you, they don't go, mm-mm, not going to be a Christian. Mm-mm. It means riches. It means splendor. It means glory. It means dignity. It means reputation. So this word glory is, say, he's saying, this is my reputation. I'm known for this. The reason why this is so important is because once you guys remember this, we're going somewhere. We are, you are the king's glory. No one can see God unless they see him through his children. Jesus made this powerful statement. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. What Jesus did is he came down on this earth. He brought the kingdom back and he goes, now I'm the king of kings. And I'm going to show you how good the father God is. I'm going to go about doing good and healing all. I'm going to set the captives free. I'm going to move and raise the dead. Hallelujah. There's nothing too big for the King of kings and Lord of lords. He said, you've seen me, you've seen my father, because I am his glory. Hallelujah. So every king is known for something. But our king is known for his goodness and his mercy and his faithfulness and his love. Hallelujah. That's good. Everyone say glory. 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 Woo! Hallelujah. 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 Anybody out there? The New Testament word for glory is doxa. It means the same thing. It's the true essence of something. Are you hearing me? It's what someone is truly like. And so all kings, they're known for their glory. Now, it's interesting because a king's glory is in what he does and what he creates. And once it creates. Okay. Okay. So we want, we want, the king wants to show off his glory. In fact, when you walk into a kingdom in the natural, you'll walk in. If you ever notice that the, the gates of a kingdom are massive and ornate and beautiful, What's the king saying? He's saying, I want you to see what kind of a king I am when you walk into these gates. 
when you're walking past the monuments or when you're going into his palace, he's giving you clues to what kind of king he is. He's like, look at the gold on the walls. Look at, look at my toilet. It's solid gold. I mean, a gold toilet, that's the kind of king I am. He's just trying to show off. He's giving people tips about who he is before they ever get to meet him face to face. The reason why this is important because you're God's glory. The reason why love is so important is because we're demonstrating the nature of an amazing king. So kings love to show off their works. Kings love to show off their creation. That's why kings are always advancing and they're building and they're conquering. Why? They're showing the rest of the people their glory. Okay? Okay. You ever heard the, the, the scriptures, be still and know? Be still and see. Watch and see my glory. Look around. It's everywhere you look. So when, I want you to think about this. I was, I was meditating on this this morning. The Spirit of God spoke to me. He said, David, he says, when my people worship me in spirit and truth, like the songs we are singing today, talking about who he is, when you begin to worship God for his nature, his provision, his power, what you begin to declare about God, his glory, will manifest. I always say this, if you need provision, Worship the provider, and provision shows up. Anybody out there? Glory to God. And so when we are worshiping him, we are declaring who he is, and who he is manifests. Psalms 4, verse 2. Listen to this. He says, how long, O sons of men, will you turn my glory into shame? He's the king. He's saying, hey, you guys are representing me. Instead of giving, instead of people seeing my glory, they're seeing Shame. Hey, what, 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 uh, what bothers me about this is we are, we are the ones who are showing God or showing people what God looks like. And there's a lot of people who don't understand the power of their representation here on this earth because there's a lot of mean Christians. I always say this, don't put on your car honk if you love Jesus if you're going to flip them the bird when they honk. Don't, don't even put, take it off. Just take it off. <laughs> don't tell people you go to church if, you're, you, if you act like the devil. Because you're taking God's glory, which should be manifested in us, so they can see the nature of a king, and instead we're acting like the devil. And he goes on to say, how long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Where are you seeking all this other nonsense, these false idols, this Facebook and all these other cars and money and houses? We're seeking all these things. And he says, that's worthless in comparison to me. Why don't you seek me? Yes. Everyone say, glory to the king. Glory. Oh, friends, he's so good. He's so good. Oh, he's good in every way. So think about this. Anything that we do that does not look like God, we, shame, we bring shame to his glory. Everyone say, glory. glory. So glory in what he made. Look at this. Psalms chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to move fast because I've got to get ahead. He says this, David talking about, now think about this, David is a king, and David's all about advancing. Can you turn the fans on on? Uh, he's about advancing and moving forward and, and building, and he, you know, a king is known for what he does and what he creates. And he looks up into heaven, and he goes, oh, God, you're, a, you're the king of all kings, because I, I can build a, a palace, but look at your creation. You're an amazing king. Now, look what he says here. He says, uh, how excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glory. Everyone say glory. glory. Above the heavens. He says, I've made palaces, but when I look up, I see what you made, and I can't compete. You're the king of glory. Think about this. One star is hundreds of thousands of trillions of light years away from the next star or however many. And God just kind of flung them out there and he can map them out by the palm of his hand. That's how big and powerful God is. Hey, I want to say glory. glory. So what David's talking about here is the creation of God and how wonderful. Has anyone ever seen a beautiful sunset? Next time you see a beautiful sunset, say, go, oh, glory to God. Look at your masterpiece. Into a beautiful beach and wake up and there's the waves lapping in on the shore and it's gorgeous and perfect. You should say, oh, glory to God. 
when I saw my wife, I said, oh, glory to God. She's fearfully and wonderfully made, and I stand in awe of your creation, Father. <laughs> glory. 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 Now, I want you to think about this. If you're an artist, anybody here an artist? Okay. Forget that example. All right. Let's just say, anybody here like to dance? Okay. So let me just say this. Uh, anybody ever built something, guys? Okay. Have you ever noticed this about yourself? If you build, a guy builds a shed. He sees the shed the whole time he's building it. But have you ever noticed when you're done, you'll stand there and just stare at it. Mm. And you'll walk away and you'll come back and you'll go, hmm. Chuck? I believe God put this in man because this is the way God is. When God makes something he's proud of, it's his glory, it's his masterpiece. He goes, "Woo! look at that. The reason why this is so important is you are his glory. You're his masterpiece. You know, they say with an artist, you know, when, when he is painting something, it, that, that art is not him, but part of him is placed on that, that, that canvas. And he's, and he's saying, this is what I'm passionate about. This is important to me. And when he signs it, when that painting goes out, Piece, a piece of the artist goes with the painting. And actually, they, they, they say that an artist's collection is known as his glory. It's, 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 it's his creation. It's precious. It's beautiful. It's part of him. I used to make cabinets when I was a boy. Started when I was 15. A very wise man said, he said, don't ever put your name on something if you're not proud of it. So if I didn't like it, I'd put my, my friend's name on it. Bill. Bill. <laughs> I remember the first kitchen I made. It was so beautiful. I just stood there and went, oh. Now, ladies, men are, men are looking for someone to compliment their glory. If your husband does anything, you should go out there and go, oh, my God. Glory. Look at this. This is amazing. A guy will work six months on something, and a woman will go, yeah, that's nice, honey. You just went and slapped him across the face. You just insulted his glory. Women. Don't you realize that he's looking for something for you to say? Think about this. When we say, when we see God and go, oh, glory to God, you're my healer. We're complimenting who he is. And he's like, that's right. Look at that. Look at that. Don't ever live a life where you're not grateful and worshiping the creator because he loves it when we talk about his creation, who he is. This is why worship is so important. So when your husband does something nice, when he sits out there and works all day mowing the grass, stop for a minute. Put Maury on pause and go out and go, woo! <laughs> Baby, you're amazing. You're my hero. <laughs> you know what he's going to do if you do that? He'll build you another she shed. He'll build you another one. He's like, I'm going back to Home Depot. I'll be back in an hour. I'm building you another one, woman. You can get anything you want from a man if you learn how to Praise him a little bit for what he's done. <laughs> Problem is, he's not doing anything because you never say anything about what he does. Why are you always working on that stuff? You should be sitting next to me. Well, if that's what you want, fine. But I tell you what, if you want to shed, go ahead and compliment something he does. Amen? Because <laughs> this is the way God is. We, he is known by his works. Everyone say his works is his nature. <laughs> Why is this so important, friends? You're his Work. Yes. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It's not, in the, it's not on the screens, but he says this. We are God's workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus, born to do good works, which he has prearranged for us to do. Here's what he's saying. You're my glory, but I want you to do good works to demonstrate my glory. Good works. I want people to go, when they see what you're doing, they go, glory to God. Lord, you're so good. Look at what Chuck just built at the church. Seriously. You bring glory to God by doing what he's prearranged for you to do. Everyone say glory. So you and I are his handiwork. His handiwork. I've only been going a few minutes, okay? So my second point, I've already talked about this. So I want you to see from Scripture that Pastor Dave's not just making this up. I believe you should have a couple Scriptures to back up it. The word of God. Amen. So number two is we are his glory. OK, so we are we are his godliness, his nature 
in manifestation. Psalms chapter 8, verse 4. It says this. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. Stop there. That was such a powerful word that they said, this can't be right. The translator said, this can't be right. Because the actual word in the Hebrew is Elohim. Which they actually, God was saying here, I made man just a little bit lower than me. Not the angels. God. For what purpose? For you have crowned him with what, guys? Glory. glory. Everyone say, I have a crown of glory. And wait till you get to heaven and see the crown God's given you before the things you did here on this earth that demonstrated his glory. He said, you're going to receive a crown. If you're a soul winner, you're going to be given a crown, a soul winning crown. It's going to be so beautiful. You want to give it back to me? He's like, no, no, no. That's your glory because you demonstrated my glory. He says here he's crowned him with glory and honor. Everyone say honor. He's made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and, and he's put all things under his feet. He says, I've given you authority on this earth to do what I've called you to do so you can demonstrate who I am so the world can see me. Anybody out there? I want to say this. This scripture is about me. John chapter 17, verse 22. Now look at this. This is why love is so important, because if you're walking outside of love, you're bringing shame to who he is. He says in John 17, verse 22, and the glory, this is Jesus praying for us and, and his disciples, and the glory which you gave me. Everyone say glory. glory. Again, Jesus was given God's glory, and Jesus walked out that glory, and everyone saw the amazing things that God did, and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Why? He demonstrated God's goodness everywhere he went. Everywhere. And so he says, the glory which you gave me, I've given them. Everyone say, he gave it to me. So you have that glory. And that they may be any time you're not one with the church or your spouse or you are not being God's glory. You're bringing shame. The purpose of this is so that they can see a unified body and they'll go, he is one. Because God's one. Have you ever thought about this? There was never an episode up in heaven where Jesus got mad at God and said, I hate you, <laughs> and ran out, slammed the door on the, on, the, on, the, on the throne, boom, run into his room and pout. Did, did Jesus ever do that? No way. I don't think so. No way. Did the Holy Spirit ever get upset with the Father and just have a, a time of just silence? No, I'm not talking to you. I'm going to pout, and you're going to pay for what you said to me for a month. Mm-hmm. Okay. The reason why this is important is because we're supposed to act like him if we want to demonstrate his glory. The moment we are not one, we are no longer bringing glory to him. We're acting in shame. And so he says, uh, just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect. Everyone say perfect. perfect. In one. Now, why? That the world may know that you have sent me. Did you hear this? He said, I've given you, Father, you gave me your glory. I'm now giving it to them that they may be one. Why? So that people will see. I'm in them. And they would know that you have sent me and have loved me and have, and have loved me as I have loved and, and have loved them as, I, as you have loved me. So he's saying here, he's given us glory so that we can be one, so that the world can see God. This is why division is so bad. Division straight from the pit of hell means to divide two visions. So he displays his love in what he creates and what he does. He made you, but he also wants you to do what he made you to do. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. It says this, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. He's saying this, that I've placed me in you because I'm love. Therefore, if you want to have the glory of God, you need to tap into the love that's inside of you and let them out. Love never fails. And the moment you begin to act like God in every situation, you're actually canceling out the bad and saying, you know what? I'm going to let the glory of God loose on the problem. Are you hearing me? Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. It says, to this, it says this, To them God willed to make known 
where are the riches, everyone say riches, riches. of the glory or his nature or the full weight of who God is. Among the Gentiles, the world needs to see it. Look at this. Which is what, guys? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, we have a choice in everything we do. Give glory to God in how we act, or to bring shame to God. You think about the woman caught in the act of adultery. A bad situation, right? Got no clothes on. I always say this, where was the guy? Got a free pass, he's the governor, high five. Get out of here quick, got the woman. Even back then, things were backwards. Showing favorites to one party versus another. Why don't we bring them both? And they said, you know, we ought to stone her. She said, according to the law, we need to stone her. Now, you've got to be careful because this is the fleshly mentality. The moment you see someone fail, your natural flesh is going to go, I've got to tell somebody. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to have to crucify them. We're going to have to throw a rock at them. And so Jesus began to, he said, he who has no sin, let him throw the first stone. And he begins to write in the sand. You guys know the story. And it says the oldest began to walk away first because we've, <laughs> the older you get, the more you realize how many huge mistakes you've made. Am I the only one that's made ginormous blunders? Am I the only one? I should put both hands up in my feet. <laughs> huge blunders. And so if I was sitting there, I'd probably have hopped up first. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> I don't qualify. Okay. So everyone leaves. Jesus looks at, looks at her and says, woman, where are your accusers? She said, there are none. He said, neither do I accuse you. Now, once you see this, we were seeing the nature and the glory of God in this conversation when it comes to God's mercy. Remember, he said, I'm merciful. I don't condemn you. Now, I want you to think about this. Jesus didn't pick up a rock. Because there's only one person there that qualified to stone the woman. He said, anyone without sin. Who never sinned on this earth? Jesus. He could have picked up a rock. Now he said, now wait a minute. They didn't qualify, but I do. Hold still. Pow! <laughs> now, self-righteousness will pick up a rock. I'm a good man. Look at me. I go to church every week. Mm. Okay, put the rock down. Anybody? Now, I want to say something really quickly here. I want to say something really quickly here. Here's a good indicator of what really is in your heart. What's in your heart will always show up on your mouth. It's always an indicator. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so you, if, I think we should all do a self-evaluation and listen to what we're saying and who we're saying it about and why we're saying it. Because the moment you say something about anybody that's not good, holy, praiseworthy, good report, you are acting shamefully and it's an evil report. And it brings no glory to God. Here's Christians, listen, here's sinners listening to Christians talk about other Christians are like, I don't want that. I already got that. I don't want that. And so listen to this. A critical mouth is a symptom of a critical heart. What have you been meditating on? Someone's faults? You meditate on long enough, that criticalness will get inside you. You're the critic. I know better. They shouldn't have done that. How dare them? If that were me, I would have never done this, okay? Well, wait till you're in their situation and you keep judging. You'll do worse. A gossiping mouth, listen to this. A gossiping mouth is a confession of an unreliable friend. Every time you gossip about someone else, you're telling everybody around you, you can't trust me. Can't trust this. Dun, 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 dun. I don't want to get too much in it because I don't want anyone to stumble when I start moving, guys. I mean, it's amazing. Now, listen to this. A heart full of faith will be declared in the mouth of someone in the midst of the storm. Praise for, or love for God will be expressed in praise. Amen. Kindness will be expressed. Love will be expressed. Encouragement. If it's in your heart, if you have courage about who you are, that courage will be expressed to bring someone who's discouraged up to the place where you're at. So what's in your heart? Anybody out there? Yeah. One more scripture here and I'm going to close. 1 John 4 verse 17. Love has been perfected 
among us. I want to say it's been perfected. <laughs> if you do the rest of this, in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as the king is, so are we in this world. As he is, if we're not acting like him, you're not giving God any glory. And here's what I found to be true. The more we walk like God, the greater the presence of God will flow from us. Because Christ is in us, he's the hope of glory. So if Christ is in us, what he's actually saying is, is if you'll just simply tap into my love instead of strife, I'll open up your heart, which is full of my glory, and I'll let out that glory, and it'll bring peace to that situation that looks dead. You're in a huge fight with somebody? Don't, don't talk about them. Go ahead and open up your heart and full, let love come out of your heart for that situation, and the glory of God will follow. It's heaven on earth. You're struggling in your finances? Don't you complain about it. Don't you talk negative about it. Begin to magnify the provider. And, and from your heart, provision will begin to flow out of your mouth. And the God of provision will manifest what you need. Paul and Silas needed freedom. And they didn't complain at midnight. Paul and Silas prayed and gave praises and worshipped and magnified their deliverer. And guess who showed up? The deliverer. Amen? We're his glory. And we're full of it. But unless you begin to open up your mouth and act and, and, and speak in the right way, it'll stay dormant inside of you. But the moment you begin to respond, whoo, out comes the presence of God. And the more we do this, the more the, the anointing, the cloud, it can fill up your car. If someone needs Jesus, it can fill up the store. It can go into the marketplace. Wherever you go, if you're a walking billboard of God's glory, he'll place more glory upon you that will, that will be a walking billboard. I know the king. I'm his glory. Watch me. I'm representing him. I'm a good guy because he's my king. I'm not perfect, but watch me. I'm going to represent him because I give, I give him glory by demonstrating his Glory. Anybody out there? I'm going to tell you two stories. You guys give me a chance to tell you two stories real quickly. C.S. Lewis wrote this, and this is not one of the stories. This is just to, to make you guys think I'm almost closing. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, he said, do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor or not. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the greatest secrets that when we are behaving as if you love someone, you will pre precisely come to love him. If you injure someone, you'll dis dislike him even more. You know why fights progress? The more you talk negative about someone, the more you'll dislike them. You never fix a problem by speaking negative. It just gets worse. He says, you'll find yourself disliking him more if you do uh, to him a good deed you yourself will dislike him much less. And here's what he's saying. Actually, we need to respond to every situation by faith. His glory's in me. I may not feel like doing this right now, but I'm going to act like it's so. I love this story, and this, this is one of my two stories. A minister named George Crane had a lady come in, and sometimes as a pastor you can get a little bit frustrated because you tell people what to do and they never do it. Not you guys. He counseled this woman over and over again. She hated her husband. He hated her. It was horrible. And so this time he was frustrated. He, she said, I'm you know, just talking about all the bad stuff he was doing. And finally he goes, I got an idea. She goes, let's destroy his life. She's like, yes, high five. So she, he, said, he said, let's go ahead and divorce her. Let's divorce her or him. Excuse me. Let's divorce him. And she's like, yes. He's like, no, no, not yet. Wait, if we divorce him now, he's going to have a party. He's going to be so happy you're gone because you're the devil. So, so <laughs> not yet. We're going to wait. He said, but for the next 30 days, I want you to really treat him like a king. So that after 30 days, he's devastated. We're going to pull the rug out. She's like, yes, high five. And so, so what he said was, he goes, what I want you to do, when he comes home at night, I want you to praise him. Man, you look handsome. Look at you, handsome devil. Woo, look at you. You might have to fib a little bit if you don't feel that way. Just act like it's so. 
Act like it. So and he said when he comes home from work, uh, have have a nice hot cooked meal for him and uh, give him the, the, the newspaper. Don't don't you know, uh, talk, you know, nag at him or anything. Just just give him the newspaper or give him the remote uh, for dessert later on that night. Give him something hot and spicy. You know, I'm just going to be really loving to him. Rock his world. OK. And and just for 30 days, just keep on doing this. Just go out of your way. So she comes back 30 days later. He goes, all right, you ready? She said, ready for what? Let's divorce him. She said, divorce him? Yeah, let's pull the rug out. She said, pull the rug out? Yeah, we're going to divorce the guy. She goes, oh, no. She goes, I don't know what happened, but he changed. <laughs> and for some reason, I love him now more than I've ever loved him. More than we even first met. It's heaven on earth. See, in his wisdom, he knew this. If he could get her to act like it's so, it would open up her heart where the glory of God was at. And by faith, God could now minister to his needs. But really, he probably didn't change as much as she changed. Because your heart will always follow your actions. That's why I always ask, what is your mouth saying? You can cover that sin with love. Because what love does. I'll read you one more story and we'll close. His name was Bill. He had wild hair, wore a t-shirt with holes in it, blue jeans, and no shoes. One day, Bill decided to visit a church nearby, uh, full of well-dressed, middle-class people. And he walked into the church, and it was, he had wild hair, again, holes in his t-shirts, blue jeans, no shoes. Church was completely packed, and the service had already begun. So Bill started down the aisle to find a place to sit. By now, the people were looking a bit uncomfortable, but no one said anything. As Bill moved closer and closer to the pulpit, he realized that there was no empty seats. So what did Bill do? He squatted down right there on the carpet, crisscross applesauce, right in front of the pulpit. By now, the tension was in the air. Everyone had stopped worshiping. Quiet. Then a deacon began to slowly make his way down the aisle from the back of the sanctuary. The deacon was in, in his 80s. He had silver hair and a three-piece suit and a pocket watch. He was a godly man. He was very elegant and dignified. He walked with a cane, and as he neared the boy, the church members thought, you can't blame him for what he's about to do. You can't expect a man of his age and background to understand some college kid on the floor. It took a long time for the man to reach Bill. The church was utterly silent except for the clicking of his cane. You couldn't even hear anyone breathing. All eyes were on the deacon. When he finally reached Bill, the elderly man dropped his cane on the floor. Listen to this. With great difficulty, he sat down on the floor next to Bill and began to worship God. Everyone in the congregation was choked up with emotions. When the minister stood up, he said, When I'm, when I'm about to pre uh, preach to you, you'll never remember. But what, this, what you've just seen, you'll never forget. You know what, you know, you know what he saw? He saw someone who wouldn't judge him just like God. That's glory. Who had come down to his level and sit with him instead of ridiculing him. That's glory. What did Jesus do? He came down to heaven, from heaven to earth. He made him feel accepted right where he was at. What if we all had this attitude in everything we did? Coming down to where people at, lifting them up, and bringing value and love and encouragement and peace everywhere we go we're a walking billboard that I'm one with the Father he's one with me I'm one with everybody here because I love just like him and by doing this people can see God's glory because I believe this as we begin to act this way the world will begin to see the acts of Jesus begin to manifest because we're simply acting like him and so his glory can flow everyone everyone bow your heads for just a moment father I know that there's so much more to this. We didn't even scratch the surface talking about your amazing glory, Father. But Lord, one thing we know is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is the greatest picture of love and faithfulness, that your heart towards us is precious and pure, that you're good in every single way. And Father, I know this, that you placed your glory in each of us. And my heart yearns, Father, that in everything I do and in everything we do, Father, that people see you. Because I know you want to move to save people from their sins, to pick them up out of the gutter and place them in that place of high victory and reigning in life. So, Father, I pray that each of us would make this decision today to leave the shameful things behind 
and to choose to act like you because you're love, Father. I pray we'd have your nature because it's in us. I pray that we'd have your ways because you're in us. And I pray that your glory would manifest the weighty presence of God everywhere we go because you're in us, Father. And Lord, if any of us have made any mistakes in the past, maybe we've gotten outside of love, maybe we've done some things we shouldn't have, Father, right now we turn from those and we repent. We ask you to cover it with the blood of Jesus and I make this decision, Father, I'll make it right. Hallelujah. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for blessing each one here. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, our Heavenly Father, the King of kings and Lord of lords is the most perfect, beautiful, kind, loving King you'll ever know. He loved you so much that while you were still a sinner, Christ Jesus died for you. Knowing, knowing how bad you are, he said, I love him anyways. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and save him. Didn't have a stone. He had blood. He gave it for you. If you need a Savior, just simply reach up and receive him. It's a free gift. All you have to do is acknowledge that he is the Son of God. He died for your sins and you'll be born again. We're going to say a simple prayer. If you want that, say it with me. You'll be, you'll, be, you'll, you'll be radically changed. Everyone say this prayer out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the King of glory. I acknowledge I need a Savior, that I've sinned, I've fallen short of your glory. And today, I turn, I, I reject my ways, and I accept your ways. Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Make me brand new in Jesus' name. We just want to say thank you for tuning in today. We pray that the word touched your life today. And we encourage you, if you're not a part of a good church, get plugged in. You need a church body. If you're in the channel area, we would love to have you come visit us anytime. We'd like to shake your hand and get to know you. There's some information on the screen below. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. God bless you. It's going to be a great day.